Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We're so happy to bring to you today Leanne Ward, an endocrinologist who works in Canada at CHEO. So I'm going to introduce Leanne, ask Leanne to introduce herself and talk to us about her work in Canada. Leanne, welcome. Oh, well, thank you so much, Pat. And I appreciate PPMD's spotlight on endocrine and bone issues in this really important context of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, or CHEO, as Pat said, and a pediatric endocrinologist here in the Division of Endocrinology at CHEO. I have a research chair in pediatric bone disorders, and I've been seeing families living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy for about the last 25 years. And in the course of doing that, I think I've become very tuned to the issues that are important to families and also the narrative that's going on among health professionals about endocrine and bone disorders. So I'm really happy to talk about this aspect today, Pat. Thank you, Leanne. We're so thrilled to have you. So as we start off, you know, there are so many endocrine issues here because of the use of steroids, the delayed uh, bone, certainly the fracture risk. And then if we look at some of the weight gain around the steroids that may cause a metabolic or subclinical insulin resistance, as well as then getting into growth hormone and, and um, testosterone to really um, make children go, you know, make these young men um, start to experience puberty. So there's such a range of issues. So could we start by sort of leveling the playing field? You often, and we often talk about practice and how various physicians use various tools at their fingertips to, to deal with some of these issues, uh, bone health, uh, puberty, growth, et cetera. And then there's evidence. Can, so can you elaborate a little bit on the difference between evidence and practice and, and why some people do things differently. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really great way to start, Pat. So I think the issue here is that steroids or glucocorticoids as they're known when they're given medicinally are used ubiquitously around the world for a whole host of different diseases. And so as clinicians, we get comfortable with understanding the side effects in different disease contexts. And we take that knowledge to each different disease like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, for example. So the issue is that in Duchenne, it's a rare disorder. So having very disease specific evidence on practice related to side effects of steroids can be challenging. So what we do instead is we sometimes need to take our understanding of the effect of steroids in different conditions or our understanding of bone development in different conditions and amalgamate that to put together best understanding and best practice in a rare disease like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There's no question we have a certain knowledge base in Duchenne, but they're in terms of endocrine and bone effects of steroids. But as I said, because we are comfortable understanding the effects of steroids sort of in a number of different diseases, then that leads to variability in clinical practice. And when you see variability in clinical practice, I believe it's because physicians are doing their best to put forward the best program for an individual child based on their global knowledge of glucocorticoids and their effect on different diseases, on Duchenne, on bone, on the endocrine system. That's challenging for families though, right? To tease out, well, what is the very best practice from among these different options that they see in different physicians? And that's where understanding the evidence base first and foremost, I think is helpful. Yeah, I think we have for more than 20 years tried to figure out what dose, what regimen is best for what person. And so I would guess that as a physician, you're looking at um, a person, their body type, maybe their parents to see, um, you know, to see if you can gain some insight into perhaps weight gain or weight management or, or for that matter, height and, and taking all those into account as you think about what steroid regimen at least to recommend at baseline. That's right. And we also take into account, in addition to those very personal um, physical or medical aspects, we're taking into account um, the information that we're giving families and their capacity for understanding the benefits and potential risks of different approaches, right? So whatever we do as physicians, first and foremost, it needs to be with informed consent with the parents and the and the child uh, understanding the implications for them. So uh, I agree that a personalized approach is important. 
The other thing that's really important for, I think, the viewership to understand is that the CDC care considerations, the Centers for Disease Control care considerations that were first developed in 2010 for Duchenne and then revised in 2018, published in the Lancet Neurology, these are minimum standards of care. This is the uh, as evidence-based as possible. And when, there, when there's no evidence, it was expert opinion-based minimum standards of care that we want every boy with Duchenne around the world to have access to. But that doesn't mean that at certain centers that have more resources or have more expertise can't at the same time be pushing the dial on the care in terms of doing things that are just a little bit more proactive or anticipatory. And I think that that's important for people to understand that the CDC guidelines are a minimum standard of care that every physician should be endeavoring to maintain, but that the standard can be higher than that. Thank you for that, Leanne. So, so I, I know that families, when they see DEXA scans, um, they're, especially at baseline, the DEXA scan reads out that they're negative one or two standard deviations below normal. So the interpretation is, okay, the bones are already at baseline weak. Can you talk to us about how to, how do you think about that? Um, what is, is the DEXA scan the best measure? Is it the measure that, and are these boys by definition at baseline below normal in terms of bone health? Um, other families have talked about spine films and that's a better indication. Uh, is that a better indication on steroids start? Can you shed a little light on testing to understand at baseline and thereafter, what is bone health and how do we understand it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And this is an area where the narrative has evolved over time. What we've come to appreciate <clears throat> is that when we think about bone health in Duchenne, we're really thinking about osteoporosis, which is defined as fragility fractures. So the ultimate clinical characteristic as to whether someone has osteoporosis or not is whether they have fragility fractures. And bone density is on the pathway to fragility fractures. It is an indicator of the potential for fragility fractures. And so bone density by DEX is something we do look at and take care of because it helps us understand potential for this ultimate endpoint of fragility fractures. Now, the nuance there is that bone density by DEXA is affected by growth. So it is underestimated in someone who's short and it is affected by weight. It is overestimated in somebody who is heavier. So it is not a perfect tool. The other thing to understand is that depending on the machine and the normative data that's used to benchmark the boy's results, and everybody uses different normative data around the world, you'll get a different Z score or Z score, as you say, in the United States. And so to have a specific Z score cutoff of minus two or worse to say that somebody is headed towards a fracture is really challenging because it the same boy will have a different Z score on different machines and different normative data. So instead, the way we work is that we look at the BMD by DEXA as a test that requires a follow-up over time to look at its directionality, taking into account growth and weight. So it has to be interpreted by an expert who understands DEXA interpretation from a fundamental perspective. In addition, we look at lots of other things. We know that the DEXA changes most profoundly when boys come off their feet. And so that's another way that we uh, make sure that we understand and interpret the DEXAs in relationship to the boys' developmental phase. We also look at the DEXA in relationship to the fracture phenotype. And I think one of the most important things that we've learned over the last decade that has informed how we approach bone health is that we know that the very earliest signs of true osteoporosis, bone fragility, are usually manifest at the spine as small decreases in the height of the vertebral bodies, which are normally square. And those vertebral bodies become a little bit flatter, like a pancake, not quite as flat as a pancake, but they start to collapse a little bit. It looks trivial on the x-ray. People say to me, but oh, that doesn't look like it's a big deal, but you should be able to maintain square vertebral bodies just by sitting alone. You shouldn't have any degrees of collapse. And when we see that, we know that that's a sign that the bones have crossed a threshold from being able to maintain their strength 
in a given individual to having lost their strength. And we now recommend treating with bone protection therapy at that very early sign, which can be as early as a few months after star starting steroids or on average about two years after starting steroids. So that's how we um, sort of put it all together. So if you're going to start treating, as soon as you see those vertebral bodies start to lose their squareness, if you will, um, what do you, do you start oral bisphosphonates? Do you start IV bisphosphonates? What is, in your view, in your medical practice, what would you recommend? Yeah, so what we proposed in the clinical care guidelines uh, based on evidence and practice from different diseases, as well as from Duchenne, is intravenous bisphosphonate therapy. These are the most widely used agents. They are the most potent. They're far more potent than oral agents, which have to be absorbed and then get into bone, whereas IV agents go straight to bone. They're also fundamentally more potent. And the evidence suggests <clears throat> that IV agents are more effective than oral agents they haven't gone head to head, but when you look at the literature in general, the IV agents um, provide more benefit per dose than what we see with oral agents. And there have been just in the last couple of years, two randomized controlled trials. One was a double blind placebo controlled trial of IV zoledronic acid compared to placebo. Um, IV placebo and the other was IV zoledronic acid compared to calcium and vitamin D including in boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And it does show that there's an increase in bone density with those agents relative to no treatment or to calcium and vitamin D alone. So I've heard, um, and it's just in loose conversation, so there's no evidence that I have read a paper on this, but I've heard that when you're using these um, IV or oral bisphosphonates, the bones, if they should fracture, they're, they're, they fracture like glass as opposed to a simple break. Is that just talk or is that true when you're using a, an oral bisphosphonate or, or an IV? Or an IV, yes. Yeah. So where that notion has come from is the osteogenesis imperfecta literature, the brittle bone disease literature, where if you over-treat, the bone loses its elasticity. So bone, we like the bone to have a certain bone density so that it's not too dense like chalk and not too little dense like a sponge. We want it to have a certain density within a certain range so that it has a certain elasticity. There, are, there should be holes in the bone, but just not too many. And so with this IV bisphosphonate therapy, if you give too high a dose and oral as well, this has been shown, and for too long, then the bone can be chalk-like and, and be more brittle as a result. And this is why it's really important that bisphosphonates are prescribed by experts who understand dosing, who understand dose titration. <clears throat> Excuse me. We don't just start a dose and then necessarily continue that dose forever. We start a dose to stabilize the skeleton in terms of its strength, and then we adjust the dose over time to match the boy's uh, clinical trajectory in terms of the fracture phenotype, as well as the bone density, and looking at other parameters as well, such as parameters in the blood, biochemical tests. So it's important that it, the bisphosphonates are prescribed by individuals who are expert in their use and know how to do that dose titration and keep the BMD in a healthy range. Thank you. That's very helpful because it is the, the osteogenesis imperfecta literature that talks about the, the sort of splintering, if you will, of a fracture. And so it's under, it's really makes sense to think about titration. So to keep the, the bone at a, at a balance, if you will, of elasticity and, and uh, growth. So, and when we talk about growth, many or, or most of uh, these young men with Duchenne and certainly some of the women with Duchenne um, uh, are because of that steroid, um, because of that steroid influence have really slowed or stopped growth. But I also think and believe that these children are also, or these young people are also probably smaller than they would have been anyway, just because of the bone muscle interaction that isn't there. So can you talk a little bit about growth hormone? Is it going to get us to the place as, as, as families, we often want to see our children as tall as whoever, um, or grow to a certain point? Uh, tell us, tell me a little bit about your view on the use of growth hormone, why or why not? And what are we asking of it when we, when we give it? 
Yeah, another really great question and one that gets asked so often because it really can be quite distressing, can't it, to see that growth plateau. It's a, a deceleration of falling off the growth curve and then sometimes a growth arrest and that can be really distressing for families. So I appreciate the question. So first of all, you're absolutely right that the uh, boys with Duchenne are shorter than than average to begin with, even independent of steroids, and just for the reason that you said. And then when you add in steroids, the main adverse effect of steroids on growth in the Duchenne setting is that they adverse effect, adversely affect the growth plate, those little cartilage plates at the ends of bones that are normally active and allow the bones to grow in length. So this is called end organ failure, meaning that the problem is right at the growth plate, as opposed to a lack of growth hormone secretion. Now, in some cases, boys with Duchenne on steroids, the steroids do affect the secretion of the growth hormone from the pituitary gland, but both in the literature and in my experience, that's usually not the case. It's usually the adverse effect of steroids on the growth plate alone. This has important implications for growth hormone therapy because growth hormone therapy works best in patients who are actually missing growth hormone in the first place because it's not being secreted in adequate amounts by the pituitary. In the Duchenne setting, most of the time the pituitary is okay from a growth hormone secretion perspective. It's the end organ, the growth plate that's failing. And so what we're trying to do is give more growth hormone to override the toxic effects of the steroids at the growth plate level. Now, when you do that, you don't get any, in my experience, significant results. So I, in the early days of my involvement with boys with Duchenne, did try growth hormone. I did growth hormone testing first. Most of the time it was normal, whether it was normal or not. We did a six month trial of growth hormone. And what we all saw was that the growth hormone was not able to override the toxic effect of steroids at the growth plate. So the growth response was not significant, not enough for the boy to say, okay, I'm willing to continue this subcutaneous injection six to seven times per week. The other thing that you have to be mindful of is that when you give growth hormone, you have to be very sure that you're actually positively impacting final height. If all that's happening is that you're growing more quickly and your bone age is also then speeding up, which would be an example of of growth more quickly without actually true growth gain, then you won't be taller at the end. And when we look at the literature, speaking of evidence, the literature has not looked with growth hormone carefully at whether the boys are just growing more quickly a little bit or whether they're actually gaining height relative to their bone age. The other thing to keep in mind with growth hormone is that it has been described in other disease contexts, of course, but also in Duchenne to have side effects potentially, a scoliosis worsening, impaired fasting glucose, as well as something called benign intracranial hypertension, which is when there's an increase in fluid around the brain. Now, fortunately, that resolves when the growth hormone is stopped. But all that to say, it's not without potential side effects. So you're always looking for benefit to risk. And based on the evidence we have thus far, the benefit does not seem to um, outweigh the risk. Um, there is one study, a pre-post study of growth hormones. So it wasn't a controlled study, but looking at the same patients pre and post, and it looked like the growth did improve a little bit over um, about a one-year period, if memory serves. Uh, but there were these side effects. And so then the question is, it, did it really make a difference? And then the bone age wasn't fleshed out. There's also a trial of recombinant human IGF-1 that has been studied in the United States and also shows improved uh, growth in the, in the short term. But again, these details about the long-term effect and side effects over the longer term, I think need to be fleshed out. So in my case, I do not routinely prescribe growth hormone. I talk to the families about it. I answer their questions based on my understanding. If somebody really wanted to do a trial of it, I would not be opposed to a trial as long as they fully understood that the benefit is not expected based on my experience in the literature for the growth hormone therapy to have um, significant benefit and that there would also be the potential for risk factors. For risk. Thank you. 
Well, thank you for that. Uh, this is such a hard conversation sometimes, you know, because you are seeing these side effects and you'd like to see what you can do. And, and sometimes I think we, we think about as parents uh, and, and me in particular, perhaps the more medicines, the more likely we have a combination therapy and get somewhere without really weighing the benefit and risk of, of what, what we're asking to do. You also mentioned um, the metabolics. As we know, some of these young, young people on steroids gain weight, considerable amount of weight. Have we ever investigated subclinical insulin resistance? Have you thought about using those um, type two diabetes drugs, metformin, SGLT2s, and other drugs in this indication? Yeah, this is another really important topic for families, isn't it? This weight gain. Now, steroids drive weight gain. Steroids stimulate insulin production and insulin perpetuates appetite. So the boys truly feel hungry and that is very hard to, to fight. And also there is just an endogenous propensity to gain weight with steroids. And it's an unusual weight gain. Anybody who has a, a child on steroids will know that there's a collection of of weight in the in the face and as well in the top of the neck, the back, and also in the trunk. And that's different than if someone just overeats to weight gain. Like if, if anyone eats too much and over time you gain weight, you, you kind of gain it everywhere. Sure, you gain it in your face and your neck and your trunk and but also your arms and your legs. So the fact that the weight gain is so um, distinct on steroids speaks to the fact that the steroids are driving that weight gain through appetite and through other weight gaining mechanisms. And I think that's really important for families to understand because I know that you know, and I know as a mom, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to just make everything just right for our kids. And, and it's really hard on steroids to, to manage the weight gain because it's driven by, you know, the medication to such a great extent. Now, of course, how you eat, you know, can influence how that plays out. And I think the main message there that I would like to share with families is that in terms of thinking about the nutrition, this is something that we we, we want to be thinking about early on in the steroid course and not late. But, you know, there's just a, a limit to how much you can do, I think, and it can be very challenging. Certainly, we recommend a partnership in that regard with a, with a nutritionist and with a supportive care team who understands the challenges. In terms of trying to use medications to alter that insulin resistance, which is part of the weight gain pathway, Yes, I think this is very interesting and very worthwhile to think about because it is a pathologically driven weight gain. And um, I'm aware of the metformin data. Metformin's been around forever. It's a very safe. It's uh, The problem is that it causes GI upset. So we've had some patients on metformin and the boys have said, oh, I just couldn't handle, you know, the tummy upset and and the effect on my stools and that kind of thing. I don't have experience with other insulin sensitizers, but I think that this is a, a really important um, area going forward that we should augment. And, and I know that we have ideas to get together and discuss how we might move the dial on this pad. So I think this is how we should be thinking about this going forward is helping families in this very challenging space with some um, potential pharmacotherapy. Thank you, Leanne. And, and I know we could talk all day, but I'm going to ask you to just um, touch on uh, the use of testosterone. When is best, uh, you know, at what time is best? How do we prepare the family and certainly the individual that's going to be receiving um, testosterone to understand the changes that are going to occur when they should occur and, and uh, how to prepare for it essentially? Yeah, just another really great question. And, and just because we're, you know, this is going to be our probably our last question just at the moment, um, although I hope we continue this narrative another time. I just want to say that this is just another example of the importance of partnering with the family, collaborating with the family, and sensitizing the family and the patient to what going on testosterone looks like and just making sure they understand and they're ready to do it, right? So I really believe in the collaborative nature of Duchenne care. So here's my Coles Notes version of delayed puberty and testosterone therapy. We know that glucocorticoids do suppress the signal from the pituitary gland to the testicles to ignite puberty by producing testosterone, which gives us those, gives boys those um, signs of what we call virilization or masculinization. So we know steroids do that. 
the average age to go into puberty if you're not on steroids is about 12 years of age boys will have the very first sign which is an increase in testicular volumes so in duchenne it may be appropriate to start talking about puberty then around 12 and because that would be normally when things would kick off but for some families that feels too early the boys aren't ready to be thinking about their puberty at that time so it's something that i feel out with families i say how do you feel about talking about puberty and then often i get well what is puberty so explain that obviously and you can tell by the response whether a boy and a family are in the zone where they're ready to talk about it and then move forward and sometimes i inch forward on the knowledge sharing over multiple visits we typically say that by about 14 if you don't have any signs of puberty on a physical exam that would be a reasonable time to start testosterone therapy and that's what's in the care considerations and i have some boys who are just not ready even at 14 in which case they ask me well is there any harm to not starting so that opens up a whole nother conversation. What are the benefits of testosterone even beyond just igniting puberty and getting that going? In the non-Duchenne setting, testosterone benefits <clears throat> bone by positively impacting muscle. What we don't know in the Duchenne setting is if giving steroids positively impacts muscle enough to improve bone. There is one study out of the UK that showed that muscle mass on MRI, viable muscle mass, um, in a pilot study was not adversely affected by the testosterone and even improved a tiny little amount. Now, not enough to necessarily um, change the phenotype or change the muscle strength to any visible degree, but it was very reassuring to see that the testosterone did not appear to be having any adverse effect on the muscle and that fits with our clinical uh, experience and so validated the fact that we do talk about testosterone and get it going by 14 years of age if boys are ready to do so whether though it has beneficial effects to bone for example remains unanswered based on the current data I think it's really important for clinicians to make sure that the boys understand when they start testosterone they will start to masculinize they will start to have some acne that they'll they'll want to have to take care of they will start to have you know some hair growth and hair growth other places and they may also start to feel differently you know this is a, a hormone that changes uh, the way boys think and feel so when we talk about testosterone with families i think we need to have a fulsome discussion about all of these aspects and most of all understand where the boy is at in his own um uh, understanding of where he wants to be from a puberty perspective. Thank you for that. I think, Leanne, we could probably go on for the next hour or two or maybe day or two. I can't thank you enough for joining us. I look forward to more and more information as, as we anticipate uh, perhaps the approval of a, a dissociated steroid that may change how we use steroids and what their effect is and, and certainly how we address um, emergency situations with, with um, uh, uh, steroid dosing. So thank you very much. And we'll continue this conversation very soon. Thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure to talk about these really important issues that, in this way. Thank you, Pat. Well, you are wonderful. And we so appreciate it. Thanks, Leanne. Mm -hmm.